So I've been asked to give a um, brief, very pedestrian, very technical talk on um, KIFO correction, and I have no conflicts of interest. Um, this is an almost evidence-free talk. So if you want a lot of numbers, I am going to disappoint you. This is a eminence-based talk, and again, uh, this is me without my toupee. <laughs> There's no question that there's a dramatic burden of a decompensated kyphoscoliosis on the human being affected. We've seen the physiologic components to it. There's an enormous psychological decrement. And again, having a balanced, harmonious, and I'm going to shamelessly adapt this term from now on from Professor Debussy, a harmonious spine is an amazingly wonderful thing. And again, our clinics are overburdened by aging patients, um, especially now. Uh, where the falling forward is a physiologic uh, component of aging. Sadly, and I'm going to revisit this in a second in a more detailed fashion, uh, such as one of our previous papers has shown, uh, major reconstructive surgeries are fraught with major complication rates. And I again want to point out the absolutely amazing work by our Vancouver colleagues who have demonstrated to us how with a modern prospective uh, data collection system, true complication rates can be and should be identified and addressed. And again, this so-called SAVES program was implemented by us in 2014. This is the complication rate that our Vancouver colleagues published, way worse than even ours at uh, the University of Washington at the time. But you know what? This is what it really takes to try to move the stakes forward. Uh, so this is a prospective uh, data collection system. We've introduced this here, and again, we've used this, and as our fellows know, actively use this to guide and change our practices. Now to surgical corrections of deformities. So osteotomies, or cutting of the spinal column, has been a mainstay in a variety of incarnations over time, and is one of the hallmarks of a deformity surgeon, aside from safely implanting a segmental fixation, which we owe to a large degree to Dr. Dubusset's work with the legendary Cotrell Dubusset instrumentation. And uh, Frank Schwab has introduced not just a classification for spinal deformities, but also corrective osteotomies. And this is what I'm going to focus on. Basically, he has identified six categories of osteotomies that we then are supposed to match to curve types, magnitude, and rigidity. And it is telling that uh, Dr. Ponte, Alberto Ponte from Rome, um, uh, published a um, uh, kind of article to clarify what his original osteotomy, the simplest posteosteotomy, actually was recently in a spine deformity journal. It's basically a resection of the posterior facet joints and ligamentum flavum, so a very radical posterior decompression, which is quite different from a Smith-Peterson approach. We simply take off spinous processes and aggressively decorticate the facet joints. So this is something that I just wanted to point out because the posterior osteotomies are an art form in itself and are very powerful if done in conjunction, but are obviously also limited in amount of excursion possible in the spine. And again, Dr. Ponte in his uh, recent article showed how you can then compress this, and I'm going to point this out as an example for how to do an effective uh, 3D intradiscal osteotomy because this is quintessential for this particular technique. Well, these three letters have become synonymous with modern adult deformity surgery. Again, thinking in a very simple, simplistic, almost angular fashion with degrees, which uh, Dr. Dubusset has just uh, very eloquently shown us is quite um, uh, anachronistic. But again, cutting the vertebral column by resecting the pedicle and determining the angle of your cut very elegantly and then straightening out the spine has become literal gospel. And again, this is a case, an example, a recent one, uh, where uh, here we did a L3 osteotomy to straighten out an ankylosing spondylitis patient. The concerns, however, are as follows, and this is why this has kind of become and remain, remain such a major factor. There's a certain degree and fear of bleeding, which is obviously understandable as we're cutting right through the segmental artery territory, such as seen on the top right picture, and we're cutting through living, bleeding cancellous bone. And secondly, we're performing a neural column shortening by tilting the spine backwards, so neural impingement is a theoretical concern. 
So as these uh, uh, illustrations show, we are shortening the posterior column and compressing them down after we have uh, resected a segment out of the ventral vertebral body. And again, this is how we used to plan this. And again, this picture on the right hand showed, uh, shows a lot of red stuff, also known as heme. So this is always the breath holding part as we're trying to have a very controlled uh, correction whilst minimizing bleeding. And again, the final result looks quite good, but there's a lot of planning, care, and experience in this. And everybody will tell you this is kind of one of the mainstays and main fears of these kind of correction surgeries. The results can be great. But what I've seen over the years is that there are some patients who come back with significant problems. So first of all, we're limited to about 30 degrees of correction. And secondarily, I've seen a fair number of patients with what you, for instance, see right here, arachnoiditis around the osteotomy site. Uh, we don't know why this happens, when this happens, how often this happens. It probably happens due to intrathecal scarring, where the CSF flow is then disrupted over time. We also don't know what it means and how to necessarily treat it. Neurologic deterioration in these patients due to a variety of circumstances, such as epidural hematomas from external sources, but also intrinsically through neural compression are also feared complications. And there are ever so often cases of uncontrolled bleeding, uh, which are obviously extremely disturbing. So as an alternative, uh, why not do something else? Well, the more extensile approach is to do a vertebral column resection. So actually taking a deficient body, such as in this 55-year-old female with an L1 burst fracture and L2 old compression fracture malunion out. So just removing the whole body. And yes, with modern hardware and neural sparing techniques, such as in this modified costa transvasectomy, we can perform these procedures, but the same fears apply. We have to resect the vertebral body around the segmental arteries. We have to release the ventral column completely, reestablish a column. But then at least we don't shorten the neural column as we rebalance the sagittal profile of the spine. This is an intraoperative view, and again, we're re-expanding the ventral column. But note these two spoons on the side here. These two spoons basically circumferentially guard the spine uh, and the spinal column from the perils of the retroperitoneum and the large vessels there. Then we can then expand a cage in there and then through posterior rods shorten the spinal column. So these are again game-changing procedures and again industry has provided us with increasingly interesting uh, and uh, usable expandable devices. They're very expensive which makes hospital administrators shriek um, the, as the profit margins shrink but um, they are undeniably powerful in terms of allowing us to three-dimensionally recontour the spine. Now, this is one of the very few data slides, but especially the ISSG has been really good at looking at osteotomies and not just measuring the spine in comprehensible and incomprehensible fashions, I'm going to say, but they're also really good at being uh, very transparent in publishing complication rates. So this is from a larger multi-center group of these ISSG uh, facilities, uh, how they're identifying complications. And again, they're very honest. There are 12% of patients who have significant motor deficits or even paralysis. And again, uh, almost one in five patients have to return to the operating room. A very important point is massive blood loss uh, identified in their text as over 4,000 cc's, which is twice as much as what we used in the UW as a uh, hallmark of major blood loss. They've identified this to be a very common occurrence in these uh, osteotomies, and especially if you try to do conventional larger PSOs and VCRs, this was a very, very common occurrence uh, with, again, a third of patients, especially with double osteotomies, having more than 4,000 cc's of blood loss. Again, that's a significant physiologic impact on these patients. And again, if they compared thoracic and lumbar osteotomies in these conventional PSOs and vertebral column resections, uh, there were actually differences in terms of lumbar spine and thoracic spine, which I thought were very surprising in that, again, thoracic osteotomies had a higher complication rate, but the blood loss was actually higher in the lumbar spine. So not necessarily clearly correlated, but prior reflection of the neural impingement uh, component of the thoracic spine osteotomies. A final data slide, and again, this is, uh, again, from the same group, but with a, a different article and a different lead author, identified age and correlations of complications. And again, here, there's not a massive difference of age, which is kind of reassuring, but there are clearly some differences in terms of uh, complication rates. And yet again, if you compare PSOs 
so the uh, standard pedicle subtraction osteotomy or vertebral column resections, you see very robust and significant complication rates. And again, the vertebral column resections, in light of their far more extensile exposure and resection, do have a higher overall complication rate. So what am I leading up to? So um, Frank Schwab has done a great job classifying the magnitude of our osteotomies. And again, he is and he's a fellow German also, so he's come up with a very regimented algorithm of what we should apply and what kind of a deformity. But herein lies my concern. So it has literally become gospel in our spinal deformity circles, and especially in adult surgery, uh, to talk about PSOs and VCRs as the only two options. And that's where I can have a problem because the complication rates are published to be over 40 to 75 percent, and a lot of those are serious complications. So why not do this a little bit simpler? So why not just leave the vertebral body, if it's halfway carrying uh, capable, halfway capable of absorbing the loads of standard physiology, why not leave that alone and cut through the disc? So don't cut the actual cancellous bleeding bone, leave the segmental arteries alone, we operate around the nerve roots that we're very familiar with, and just replace the deficient discs and then rebalance the spine in conventional ponte type fashion. We are well familiar with how to do this. This is a high-grade spondylolisthesis, and I think all of us who do spondylolisthesis surgeries, if we believe in reductions, know how to do a sacro or lumbosacral osteotomy and rebalance the spine safely. We protect the nerves, we very carefully reduce the deformity, and we establish an anterior column height from which we can work to then rebalance the th spine three-dimensionally. So we published this uh, as a biomechanical study a couple of years ago in Spine in 2010 with Mike Lee as the primary author. And again, we basically could show that this kind of an intervertebral osteotomy actually was very powerful to allow us for up to 30 degrees and more of uh, kyphal correction. Again, there's some level dependence, but that's not particularly important. But on the right-hand bottom column, you can see that if we put an interbody space in a distracted lumbar spine, and thoracic spine actually also, we can tilt the spine back very powerfully uh, per level. So we can also, and we did not publish on this, but it's intuitively clear, I think, uh, correct coronal deformity. So if we need to kind of rebalance the spine like this, we can simply put our spacers eccentrically into the concave side of the deformity through intervertebral spreading, and then place our spacers in such fashion that it automatically rebalances the spine. So this is an intuitively clear thing. This is a case, an example, a 60-year-old female. She had six previous lumbar surgeries. She has a usual transition breakdown. She has stenosis above, and she walks in a kyphotic fashion. This is a very simple case, and again, there are multiple options. The dogma would probably be to give her a PSO or even a vertebral column resection at the very top, although that would be very aggressive. We did the simplest solution. We did an intervertebral uh, intradiscal osteotomy, put a cage in, and aggressively tilted her back, and she was actually really very happy with this result. Modern, minimally invasive, uh, oblique, and far lateral exposures, such as done by Dr. Oskuyan here and uh, my partner, Dr. Rowe, uh, obviously may accentuate the abilities to kind of establish and reestablish a ventral column. I'm not sure where we are yet in that um, because we don't have really well-published literature, but the advent of expandable intervertebral cages, as uh, shown in our former fellows, uh, Nick Kwanda's nice biomechanical study, does seem to augment our capability to yet again accentuate this deformity correction even more, such as shown here in these nice diagrams uh, on the right-hand side, where the use of expandable cages did augment uh, kyphal correction dramatically. So final case and example, this is a 58-year-old male. He had an L1 burst fracture. He had literally been treated for about six years non-operatively with every brace imaginable. He had fallen victim to a Washington State, maybe not just Washington State-specific problem. He was completely opiate dependent. This is a healthcare provider himself who is physiologically otherwise fit and who came in this unacceptable kyphotic position. He was, again, just not himself anymore and asked for help. After a lengthy detox period and uh, augmenting his bone substance, which had become deplored and depleted um, through inactivity uh, with uh, medicational supplementation, we finally did an intradiscal osteotomy above his burst fracture and used expandable cages at the lumbosacral junction. And I'm happy to tell you that this man is over a year out now and he's absolutely thrilled with the surgery. And no, Dr. Rowe, this was not done minimally invasively. <laughs> so uh, basically in conclusion, um, 
I personally think this is, again, there are no results on this. Uh, I've done this for many years now. I think it makes logical sense, and I hope that our next generation of fellows who are about to start will uh, start picking up um, our uh, retrospective data and go forward. This kind of an expanded Ponte procedure, and I want to credit Dr. Ponte for his uh, work in this with an intradiscal osteotomy and an intervertebral distraction and a meaningful anterior column support as a pivot point or fulcrum uh, together with a posterior compression and balancing such as described by Dr. Ponte is a very meaningful option instead of a PSO. It avoids all the pitfalls of a standard PSO and VCR. There's minimal to no vertebral body bleeding. The osteotomy lines that you perform don't predetermine correction. You actually have a very dynamic way to reassemble the spine. You have minimal or no dural buckling, and you have better bony foundation or support actually for your cages. We'll show this hopefully in the lab somewhat meaningfully in a demonstration later. So again, this is my declaration from before. The results, it's blank. Hopefully this will change in the near future. I have, however, no doubt that doing deformity surgery well positively changes lives. And again, I can only imagine what this patient uh, in Holland in the uh, 15th century went through in their lives, but it's, it's remarkable to see how patients are adversely affected in their entire well-being from significant spinal deformities. So as we look at spinal deformity correction surgery options and independent of lengths and derotation maneuvers, and we'll have excellent lectures on all of these subjects by our outstanding speakers later, I do think that this intradiscal 3D or I3DO, we have to have acronyms these days, right? Uh, Kojo, we have to have acronyms, it's important. Uh, love it, okay, good. If it has your approval, um, it'll be good. Uh, it fits into a spectrum of the overall armamentarium. This is not a one-trick uh, uh, pony. This is, fits into the overall scheme of things, but I do think it has a veritable role in there. It makes intuitive sense to me. Take-home messages for all of you are major spine surgery is a major undertaking, and it should be treated as such. We should understand the deformity, and again, we're only in the beginnings after seeing Jean Dubusset's great talk again. I feel, yet again, I'm the eternal pupil of Dr. Dubusset's. There's so much to learn and understand, and I think we're only in the beginning of true biometric understanding of uh, adolescent and uh, adult deformities. Patient prehab is an unbelievably important thing, and I think from one of the things, uh, one of the many things I've learned from Dr. Dubusset is prehab also starts with uh, the uh, traction and the uh, distraction of pediatric and adolescent patients. And I'll be curious to hear Dr. Skaggs' thoughts on that later. Finally, the most important point for me is PSOs and VCRs. When I go to deformity meetings, this is gospel, and everybody just talks about these acronyms. I really think that this is by far not everything. There are very simple other ways to do this, and regardless of what, you have to have a precision performance as you execute these. It's a great joy to be here again, and uh, thank you all for your attention. And I'll show a little bit of this in the lab, hopefully in a visible fashion in a short while. So thanks again. <laughs>